What a beautiful sound, echoing as it has for over a century, high among the snow-capped mountains of the San Juan National Forest in America's great southwest. It's the whistle of a steam locomotive, and her year-round job is to pull a famous and historic passenger train, the Silverton. This same kind of coal-fired, steam-powered engine opened up the richest corner of Colorado. It was a mining train, working its way through an area now known for the Indian ruins at Mesa Verde National Park, great ski resorts, and pure scenic beauty. We're at the original station in Durango, Colorado. Here, the Silverton train begins its daily trip north into the towering peaks of the Continental Divide. And today, we're going to take that trip. A 90-mile adventure-filled ride starting out more than a mile high in Durango and climbing nearly 3,000 feet higher to the old mining town of Silverton. It's this trip that has made the Durango and Silverton Narrow Gauge Railroad a living legend, a national treasure. Dawn is just breaking, and things are getting underway in the roundhouse. Engines that worked yesterday are being prepared for today's run. Glowing coals in the fireboxes, carefully tended during the night, need only a little stirring and a few shovels more to be ready. These five steam locomotives are like no other engines in the world. The newest one took to the rails in 1925, and though they've steamed hundreds of thousands of miles, they're all in condition to go just as many more. Well, it's time. The roundhouse doors open, and the iron horse inches from its overnight berth to the turntable. Meanwhile, the crews are busy with the last of their preparations. The tender is heaped with coal. The car men make a routine but careful inspection along the string of golden yellow coaches. And the concession cars are replenished. Inside the century-old depot, the ticket office and waiting room are a buzzing with anticipation. A warm fire in the bright nickel-plated stove feels good in the crisp mountain air of a Durango morning. And then they hear it. People rush outside with their cameras to get themselves a picture. The locomotive slowly backs toward the cars for coupling. A solid clunk from a leading car is the signal to all on board that the Silverton train stands ready. Some passengers are swapping talk with the engineer and the fireman. Others are hurrying to take their assigned seats. Now the conductor makes a final seat check. A few standby passengers who are waiting for an empty seat or two grab their tickets and climb aboard. The conductor gives the high sign. The engineer gives two blasts of the whistle. Eases the throttle open. And we're rolling.
Silverton cautiously crosses the downtown streets, it's easy to understand why Durango is called the narrow gauge capital of the world. Whistles for each street crossing are answered by waves from townspeople all along the track. This historic city has preserved a lot of its Victorian charm. With its colorful past and surrounded by awesome natural attractions, Durango offers a complete range of vacation accommodations to visitors from all over the world and in all four seasons. Picking up speed now, the coaches begin that gentle sideways rolling motion, characteristic of early railroads. A few steps in the aisle though, you'll get your sea legs and roll with the rhythm. Walking around, you'll notice the cars on this train have a little variety. There are the regular coaches, of course, and some open-air gondola cars, which let you have a big sweeping view. Concession cars. And a parlor car, too. Up ahead of all this is the engineer. His skill and experience got him the job and the glamour of running a locomotive. But he's not really the one in charge. It's the conductor, the man taking the tickets, who's in command. He's got the responsibility for making this trip safe, enjoyable, and on time. He's also the man with all the answers. Few passengers can ask questions about the Silverton that'll stump the conductor. The first of five strong bridges brings us to the Animas River. It was named El Rio de las Animas Perdidas, or River of Lost Souls, by the Spaniards the first Europeans to explore this country as they traveled north from Mexico. The original rails for this route were laid down in 1881, and they follow close to the course of the Animus on up the canyon. High in the mountains, rain and melting snow form countless clear and rushing creeks that become the headwaters of this river. Many of these sparkling streams will be crossed as the train heads to its destination. The clicking of steel wheels on rail joints sets the Silverton's pace at a relaxing 20 miles an hour. Just about our top speed for the day. Through this fertile highland with its farms and ranches and a growing suburban population. You know that valley between those red striped ridges and cliffs was carved by glaciers less than a million years ago. Just yesterday in geological terms. But today, it's hard to imagine a glacier big enough to fill it. Here at Hermosa is the first water tank, surrounded by all sorts of rail, spikes, and machinery. You see, the foundation of safety is found among these kinds of things. Keeping that roadbed fine-tuned and free of obstructions is a thankless job, but one that maintenance of way workers have been proud of for generations. Maintenance like this is something of a lost art, something that's been handed down from father to son on this line. Just beyond Hermosa, the passengers become aware of a new sensation, climbing. The valley seems to drop away as a steepening grade yields to more than a hundred tons of locomotive and tender. The fireman shovels on more coal. The engineer hits the throttle and the powerful sound of the Silverton echoes off the wooded slopes. The scent of pine mixes with cold smoke as the train is pulled into the folds of a narrow canyon. The river far below cuts its way into a deep gorge. Down there is Shalona Lake. That means we'll soon be pulling into the old Frontier Stagecoach stop at Rockwood. This meadow surrounded by high cliffs is as far up the tracks as today's automobiles can take us. From here on to Silverton, it's up to these locomotives to get us through the mountains.
see what they do to keep them running like new. Ever so often, things have to be replaced, but there's no way to get parts for engines this old, so they make them right here. Now, this is not your run-of-the-mill machine shop. These folks do complete rebuilds using tools as big as the job itself. It's all done to keep the engines running sure and strong for years to come. As we come out of Rockwood, the train seems to pull in its elbows, and we officially cross the line into the San Juan National Forest. A few seconds later, passengers on the Silverton get their first look at the incredible Animus Canyon Gorge. The cars wind around a sweeping curve, and then, slowly, the train moves out onto the spectacular High Line. Up here, the rails cling to a narrow ledge, 400 feet above the raging Animus River. It's hard to believe that the roadbed here was blasted from the cliff with black powder by men dangling from ropes more than a hundred years ago. Just as we're coming off the High Line, we enter a heavily forested area. Just the other side of this, the Animus River comes up to meet us, and we cross a 130-foot-long bridge. I imagine old General Palmer and his boys had a time building this one. Yep, William Jackson Palmer built this line, and all the rest of the Rio Grande Railway. To service all this mountainous territory, his trains would have to go where tracks had never been laid before. Sharp curves and steep grades were impossible for the big flatland trains, so everything had to be built smaller. The locomotives were built to run on rails set just three feet apart, and that's why we call this a narrow gauge railroad. It was the only way through these mountains then, and it's still the only way to see this part of the country. This is true wilderness, so don't be surprised if you spot some deer or elk in there amongst the trees. One passenger even saw a mountain lion, although I should mention he saw it from the parlor car. <laughs> That's the only car that serves libations, you see. And it's called the Alamosa, one of the oldest on the line. And I guess it's fitting that one of the oldest cars is the one that brings out the most interesting stories. When the passengers aren't telling them, the bartender is more than happy to let go with a few. And the ghosts on Myers Avenue still boast of the bat he took. Old Bathless Bill lived on Bull Hill, two miles from Cripple Creek. And he struck a rich in an open ditch where others scorned the seat. It was near midway, at about midday we heard his joyful shout, Muckers, skinners, and dance hall sinners all came a-running out, and there Bill stood, with gold as good as any ever found, and damn his hide, his grin was wide as he passed the stuff around. The Alamosa and every other coach on the train has a story to tell. Originally built for the Denver and Rio Grande Railway, most of them had been stored in the Durango Yard, but some were brought in from other parts of Colorado and states beyond. Their reconstruction takes place in this building, called the car shop. Here they get completely refurbished and carefully tailored back to their original blueprint specifications. Now I hope you noticed I didn't say almost like, or similar to the original. In this car shop, the most important thing is authenticity. Even the coal-burning stoves used to warm up many of the cars are the same type they used in the old days. We're coming into Cascade Canyon now, where during the winter, the train is turned around on what we call a Y. Up beyond this point, there'd be snow slides covering up the tracks. But from here on back to Durango, folks who ride to Silverton from November to May get a special treat narrow gauge railroading in the silvery San Juan winter. It's 
summer now, though, and we're pressing on into even more awe-inspiring country. One more time we cross the Animus River and enter the land of the glory holes, abandoned mine shafts from long ago. And way up above them, the Needle Mountains pierce the sky at more than 14,000 feet. All the timber they needed for mine and railroad construction was cut and floated downstream to a sawmill, which was once located here at Teft. Now to Silverton is the only way to see all this close up, but we nearly lost her. You see, along about the 1920s, automobiles were starting to move around, and things got fancier and faster. That made the train less attractive. By the middle of the century, most of the narrow gauge tracks around Colorado were being torn up, and the Silverton was in line for the same sad fate. The people of Durango and Silverton fought abandonment by the Denver and Rio Grande for years. But in 1981, one man put that fight to rest. Charles E. Bradshaw, Jr., a Florida citrus grower and a man dedicated to historical preservation, bought the Silverton line. Charlie, as he's known in Colorado, quickly set about restoring and strengthening this railroad. Today, it runs all year round allowing us to see this breathtaking country and giving us a real journey through the past. Right now, that journey is slowing down to take on water. We've reached the old mining camp and stagecoach stop at Needleton. Not much left now, but once it was the center of operations for hundreds of miners. On up the canyon, a couple of 13ers can be seen. We're going to be surrounded by 13,000-foot mountains all the rest of the way into Silverton. And you'll be able to see where avalanches from those peaks have come crashing down, sometimes covering the tracks. Icy creeks can also be seen flowing into the Animus River. This is a mountain scene very little changed from the way it looked when the train rolled through here more than a hundred years ago. The canyon opens up now. And there's our destination, the town that gave its name to the train, Silverton, mining capital of the San Juan Mountains. Plenty of time here to get a bite to eat, walk along the old sidewalks, browse through the shops, and take in that wonderful Victorian and Western tradition. A tradition that lives on today, because Silverton, like the train that once hauled its riches, is being preserved as a registered National Historic Landmark. Some passengers will take a bus back to Durango after the visit, but most folks enthusiastically look forward to the return run down through the mountains aboard the train. That old familiar sound signals our departure from Silverton. Now heading for Durango, the first thing to strike you is how different everything looks. See, that's because those who were sitting on the left side coming up from Durango were looking out to the west, toward the La Plata Mountains, the Hermosa Cliffs, the waterfalls, and so on. Now, going back, people in the same seats will be looking to the east, toward the tallest peaks, the different streams, the side canyons and such all on the other side when we came up. You know, riding this train, it's easy to think you're on another kind of trip, one of another age. And looking out that window, you can imagine you've drifted back a hundred years in time. The steam locomotive up ahead, the rhythmic, restful roll of the coach, the clicking of the wheels on narrow gauge tracks, and the unspoiled wilderness outside. All is today, just as it was a century ago. And on the Silverton, it'll stay that way every year, all year round. Those glory days you never got a chance to live are still waiting for you on board the Silverton. Beautiful daughter of the DNR 
GPS you weigh about a thousand tons. Well, that's a 45 mile through the Animas Canyon, so they set her on a narrow gauge. She drank a whole lot of water and she ate a lot of coal, and they called it the Silver Tone. Thank you. 